morning, Ed. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, thanks. All right. As I explained briefly to you, I'm conducting a short uh, research project to understand how trends in the discipline of anthropology take shape. Is it to do with funding bodies? How funding bodies interact with personality, with mm. political issues going on in the world, with uh, events, chance? Um, so if I could take a few minutes of your time. Uh, and first of all, if you could maybe tell me how you, s how you became an anthropologist in the first place. Mm. What, what mm, made you decide? Was it something you had already in mind or something that happened? I think, like many people, the story of why I became an anthropologist works at different sorts of levels, my background, what sort of things I was interested in when I was younger, but also serendipity and chance have played roles too. Um, in my own case, quite simply, when I was younger I went travelling um, by accident to South Asia. I would not really intended to do this at all, um, and I realised that because I had gone by accident. I didn't know anything about the land I was passing through, what I was seeing, um, and I spent a lot of time just thinking about the people I met along the road. Um, and when I got back to Europe a year later, um, I was really curious. I just wanted to know more. I wanted to learn about where I'd been and what I'd seen because I'd not had an opportunity to read about it in advance or really to think about where I was going to go in advance. Um, and that took me to study anthropology at the University of Manchester at the time. Um, so I, I really stumbled into it because I'd been on holiday by chance and then after I'd finished my first degree I went back to India again to think about um, the things I'd been studying but to think about it in the context of being in India. And on that occasion I went by, not by chance, by design this time to work on a particular development project in eastern Gujarat, um, a site called the Namada Dam, where at the time large numbers of people were being resettled mm -hmm. um, because of the rising waters yes. and the infrastructure development that was happening around it. And I became very curious about Gujarat because... Uh, um, Which year again was this? That must have been 95, I think okay. that was 95. Can I, can I interrupt one yes, second please. and bring it back? So, did you even know what anthropology was? Obviously, you must have known what anthropology was to to go back to Manchester and decide. I, I remember that when I start, I decided to to study anthropology. I didn't even know what anthropology was, and it, I was somehow addressed in that direction from yes. some when teacher. So it, it's it's. When we interview undergraduates, or we don't anymore, but when, when we did interview undergraduates or when we read undergraduates' personal statements when they're applying for, for admissions, mm -hmm. we do look for evidence of whether they know what anthropology is or not right. by um, what kind of books they've read or how they write about anthropology. And in my case, um, I'd had a teacher at high school who had recommended that I might be interested in studying anthropology because um, I was studying A-level sociology. Uh, so I had read a couple of books, and I can remember being interviewed for places um, as an undergraduate student and having to discuss those books with the people who were interviewing me. And one of the, I remember study, um, discussing a book called Stone Age Economics with Peter Louisos at the London School of Economics. Right. And I remember studying a book on growing tobacco in your back garden um, with somebody called Janet Carsten at the University right. of Manchester. Mm -hmm. um, and I could see that they were books that they, they were both they both knew and were interested in, but I couldn't say that I knew anything about the theory or the history of anthropology. I knew a little sure. bit about what anthropologists did, mm -hmm. or at least I thought I did. Um, sure, thank you. Um, you. You can go back to we you had left the Narmada. Yes, so I, I took a break from working um, as a volunteer on the Namada Dam resettlement sites and I cycled again around the coast of Gujarat um, thinking now about doing a PhD place and I bought myself an Indian bicycle, a uh, one gear, a he very heavy thing in a place called Bhavnagar and then I cycled all around the coast stopping at each and every port along the way. What time of the year was that? That was probably in the spring, so it wasn't too hot, and at the, that time, right. even back in the 90s... Well, what did people think about you cycling? Very kind, very generous, um, maybe a little bit eccentric, why are you cycling mm -hmm. rather than taking the bus? Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I travelled around the coast on my, on my bicycle and I ended up in a place 
in an area of Gujarat known as Kutch and came to a town called Mandvi which I instantly thought was one of the most amazing places I'd ever been to. It was old, it was very cosmopolitan, there were people from all over with stories about being all over the Indian Ocean and there was something very gentle, um, something very relaxed about it but also something quite sincere which I really appreciated. The fact that it also had a, quite a nice beach added to its uh, attractiveness <laughs> and that was where I ended up spending a couple of years um, doing my PhD research on on shipbuilders and maritime community. So if I may ask again a couple of questions, because as, as I said, I'm interested in understanding the relationship between chance and mm, other kinds of uh, events, structures. And mm. so uh, you said that first you went on holiday by accident, but it was an accident that was also in a way caused by a certain political situation in Africa, wherever yes. that was that didn't allow you to, to go there. And, and then how, how did you end up working uh, on the Narmada resettlement uh, project? Through friends of friends who put me in touch with somebody who, who led um, one of the resettlement organizations, right. um, someone from North India actually, from a place called Moradabad. So it was through somebody else's personal network that I was taken mm -hmm. there. And then um, it was actually, I think if I remember correctly, it was through somebody I knew from London who suggested that I go to Kutch mm -hmm. and to Manvi in particular because they had family connections right. there. So actually my first connection with anybody in Manvi came from a connection in London. Mm -hmm. So it was like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you, so then uh, you went, came back to London and went back to Manvi to conduct research for, for your PhD? Yes. Next, you you obviously have have uh, had a lot of a uh, lot more experience of uh, yes of research. Um. That PhD research was funded by the Economic and Social mm -hmm. Research Council, which um, in some ways gave me an experience of a particular sort of anthropology that it's more social science oriented, perhaps, than it is humanities oriented. Um, which I think has had some subsequent influence on the kinds of research that I've done. So in a nutshell, more recently I've been interested in what you might think of as the anthropology of big stuff, mm -hmm. the anthropology of earthquakes, the anthropology of post-colonial history, um, and now the anthropology of roads and infrastructure in South Asia. And what took me into that, in that direction was in Gujarat in 2001 there was an earthquake. Um, and I wasn't in Gujarat at the time, I was in University of Santa Barbara in California and I feel quite naturally I was concerned for the people I knew, for my friends in, in Kutch and that concern eventually led to a research project thinking about post-earthquake reconstruction in an anthropological mode. So I was taken into earthquake research by concern for my friends, not mm -hmm. because I would had any longer term interest in in earthquakes or in post-disaster reconstruction or the anthropology of humanitarianism, however you mm. might want to think about it. Um, but that accident was actually, accident, that catastrophe was very influential because it, I spent the next 10 years of my life mm. repeatedly visiting the f same field site, repeatedly asking the same questions and looking what happened to the earthquake, what happened to the memories of the earthquake, the way it was described as the years went by. So that was for 10 years. And during the course of that, one of the most um, dominant themes in post-earthquake reconstruction in Gujarat at that time was road construction. Mm -hmm. A lot of the effort of the state government had gone into road construction. Buj, which was a very small town in the centre of Kutch, had three concentric ring roads built around mm -hmm. it. And the people I knew there were enchanted by these ring roads. They were a sign of modernity, a sign of their arrival. People were going to have picnics on the roads on, the road. on a Sunday evening, just mm -hmm. not when they were full of traffic, but before they were full of traffic. And there was something quite magical and almost enchanting about the roads and the way they entered mm -hmm. into the lives of this small town. And thinking about that and that experience of perhaps not fully understanding why slabs of tarmac were such influential symbols um, and themes in people's lives, places of optimism and hope almost, you could think. I didn't understand it. Yeah. But obviously you, you yourself used or were in some way interested in road from 
much before you. You seem to have cycled all the way from Europe to to India, and and I mean, is is there something? Is is it something that you had somewhere at the back of your mind before, or or can you actually answer that question? Or is, is I it think it's fair. To I think it's fair to say that in some ways I've been in ro- interested in roads for a very long time, mm. of which perhaps the that cycling trip I mentioned across Asia was one example. But mm. before that, I, um, I was interested in roads in different sorts of ways, in fiction and influenced by Jack Kerouac, driving backwards and forwards across America and thinking about what mm-hmm. it was like to be on the road um, in a particular sort of way, thinking and moving and mm. living in a, a moving landscape, in a, pla- in a moving place that passed between mm-hmm. different sorts of places. So yes, um, I think the interest in roads runs deep. Um, and I've also really recently discovered an in- interest in other kinds of infrastructure in like ports what? and containers mm-hmm. and things like that and I don't know where this interest comes from perhaps it stems from roads but I was in my um, late father's attic not very long ago and um, I came across a model container port mm-hmm. with cranes and containers in it <laughs> all of the things that I suddenly found myself interested in 40 right. years later right. you know that's quite right. strange mm-hmm. in a way but I also think that it's not only about having childhood interest in things it's about things becoming salient in the present right it's about yeah. roads so many roads are being constructed in the world at the moment that it's it's a, it's a matter of now it's a matter of thinking about anthropology as a as a, a subject that is equipped to attack to tackle and address contemporary issues mm. that that's what i want to bring it because you seem to have been successful with most of your projects to attract funding um, by by the ESRC or the European Research Council, how do you think that mm, happened? I mean, obviously you're you're good at writing uh, proposals, but do you think there is some sort of synergy between sudden events like the unfortunate event of the earthquake and um, and changes in the discipline as well, or or changes in interests in of funding bodies? I think that's a very interesting question and quite difficult to answer without giving away all of my secrets. Right. <laughs> 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 <coughs> I, think, I think the question is a good one in the sense that disasters and events and processes in the world that are newsworthy, attractive and current have more of an emotive pull perhaps mm-hmm. in terms of writing grant applications. But I also think that grant applications can push at the edge of things, mm-hmm. and move things on. Mm-hmm. So for the, exa- the example of the roads application, which was to the European Research Council, lots of people have studied roads. Lots of people have thought about roads. Roads as material things, roads that connect people. Mm-hmm. But not many people have thought about the thought that goes into roads. So the project is about something else other than the road. The road, yes. if you like, is a device to think about other thoughts, to think about other realms of knowledge. What precedes roads or what comes after? Or, or Both, in a way. What thought is going into the construction of so many roads? What ideas are actually mm-hmm. leading bulldozers so to... So about sustainability, about the future of the world? I or think about or, or yeah. So I think the question of sustainability is a question about what comes after the road. Mm-hmm. The question of global sustainability is, of course, there within the project about roads to, to think about why institutions with one hand are thinking about climate change mm-hmm. and sustainable development orders, and on the other hand are investing massively in infrastructure, which has a multiplier effect that people are only just really beginning to understand and thinking 50 years into the future the consequences of current road building spree in Asia and Africa will have a tremendous effect on the ways in which the planet is organised. So although roads is the artefact, the way in, Mm -hmm. the actual questions are slightly different. What do you think of the the role of chance in anthropology? Chance as a method of inquiry? Anthropology seems to be based a lot on the idea that um, you uh, a 
as an anthropologist, you need to be open to to things to things to happen. So, so to, to be open to receive a knowledge that is different from yours, to to understand something um, other in 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 some way, and for that you you need to have a certain naivety if you if you want. Do you think that has played a role in your own research? Do you? Mm -hmm. I think the orthodoxy of the discipline at the moment would be to say that things like naivety, serendipity, chance, openness were one key part of a fieldwork method which, which would go along with a more professionalised sense of ethics, confidentiality, mm -hmm. informed consent. So you mm -hmm. have the two aspects. However, research that I've recently been doing with someone who looks remarkably like <laughs> you actually um, has uh, made me question some of these things because by we've been involved in a project where we've been re-looking at anthropology that's already been done mm -hmm. so if you like to think about that studying the place twice mm -hmm. but using different people to do it and of course gender ethnicity language personality and so on. All of those personal variables come into play in who and what and how you can know things during fieldwork. But at the same time, some of the structuring structures of the local society, the place, have been evident to both researchers. Right. So serendipity is so perhaps... Uh, serendipity is perhaps a device which exists because anthropologists typically only do research once in one place. So everything is serendipitous because they don't know any of anything otherwise. Whereas doing the same thing twice gives a slightly different sense mm -hmm. of what is real, what is not, mm -hmm. what is serendipitous, and what is accidental. Mm -hmm. um, I think I have maybe one last question going back to the roads and sustainability, and it's about how, how far do you think anthropologists are equipped to make predictions about the the future? Thinking of anthropology as a discipline that is that responds to current events in, in particular ways. Mm. Mm. That's also a very interesting question. Um, I think the future for academia more generally is becoming increasingly important. Mm -hmm. There's a university in Holland that has just opened the Department of Futurology. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Future sustainability. I think big agendas like a sustainability agenda, mm -hmm. which is becoming a global agenda, sure. is forcing people to look forwards, mm -hmm. perhaps in a more clear and stronger sense than they have done in the past. Mm -hmm. Because the sustainability agenda is all about the future. The future sure. Now, whether anthropologists using traditional modes of fieldwork, participant mm -hmm. observation and long residences in one particular place are well equipped to comment on the future using that traditional set of mm -hmm. methodologies they have, I'm not so certain. But I do know that anthropologists are interested in things like climate change, mm -hmm. in local sustainability practices, in thinking about local community organisations, alternative economics, alternative ways of organising the distribution, production and distribution of food and resources. Mm -hmm. I think much of the work that anthropologists are doing is at the cutting edge of those sorts of agendas, um, informed by, somet sometimes in a radical politics, sometimes by a more general sense of humanitarianism, thinking about the future being everybody's future mm -hmm. rather than just ours or theirs or theirs or ours sure. future but thinking about a globalized generalized future um, mm. is I think beginning to drive a research agenda it's certainly driving my interest in roads which is a very future Oriented. looking project absolutely and I guess I mean this intersects with the questions about politics to me at least, in the sense that the, the future, you know, ideas about the future are also shaped about ideas of how you think or you would like the future to be in some way, and I imagine it's quite difficult to disentangle those from, from your uh, research. So how much do you think your own ideas or <laughs> desires or projections for, for, mm. for a future have also mm, had an impact on the on the ways you, you chose your sub subjects and yes. areas. Mm. I think that if I can talk about the 
the roads project, which is looking at the construction of infrastructure in South Asia in a more general sense, there is a broader pattern of um, political positioning behind what I've written. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think it's important in a project like this to be agnostic about whether roads are good or bad. To start with a relatively open mm -hmm. mind as to that question. To begin to explore why so many institutions, individuals, governments, and conglomerations of interests, that's the other thing, it's mm -hmm. not just one sure. factor that's driving the construction of roads. So to start with an agnostic position allows you, I think, to survey a broad scene and get a feel mm -hmm. for what the main currents and trends are in thinking about these sorts of questions. But at the same time, being interested in relating that sort of anthropology and anthropology of institutions to a politics of sustainability is inevitably a political position. Mm -hmm. But that's where I think anthropology can be interesting because anthropology can be disruptive thought. Sure. It can disrupt processes and yeah. trains and it can point out that the arguments on which the construction of roads are built and is an artifice. Mm -hmm. It's a form of ideology. It's um, And intervening disruptively in that those sorts of debates I think is actually very useful and is one of the powerful uses to which ethnographic research can be put. So it's an argument in a way beyond the truth of roads themselves but it's an argument about how things are made to appear meaningful which is sometimes quite difficult to explain mm -hmm. to non-anthropologists that that is an anthropological mm -hmm. mode yeah. of analysis. Yeah, and I think that brings us to a whole other discussion about ethics and politics that maybe we'll really... Could I ask you a question? Sure. Um, what do you intend to do with the interviews you're doing as part of this project? I'm intending to, to probably uh, work on a, uh, on a publication uh, which will uh, rethink some of the uh, current methodological trends in the in the discipline, and in particular, as I said at the beginning, the yeah that will engage with what the role of uh, of chance or naivety is in anthropology as a as a methodology. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, there might be a few things I will want to follow up, so I might uh, drop you an email. And yeah, I'll I'll be in touch. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>